Welcome to the 31st episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Don Winslow, author of the novel Savages, which was recently picked as one of the top 10 notable books of 2010 by the New York Times. Well, this is uh, Jeffrey Deaver, author of, uh, most recently, The Burning Wire, and uh, soon to be author of the next continuation James Bond novel. I spend a lot of time writing, a lot of time researching my books, um, but uh, when I'm not doing that, I, I love uh, listening to the Reading and Writing Podcast, which you can hear at readingandwritingpodcast.com. Well, welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest tonight is Don Winslow, author of many crime and mystery novels, including Death and Life of Bobby Z, California Fire and Life, and The Winner of Frankie Machine. Winslow's new novel, Savages, has been receiving rave reviews, including a prominent ecstatic review by Janet Maslin in the New York Times. And there's even been film interest in Savages with Oliver Stone discussed as possible director. Don, welcome to the Reading and Writing Podcast. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, Savages, wow, what a novel. Almost every reviewer has mentioned the first chapter of Savages. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and, and in typical proper New York Times parlance, Janet Maslin <laughs> struggled to explain the first chapter in, in, in proper English. Uh, I'm curious, why don't we give my listeners an idea of how you get Savages started? How about reading the first chapter? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Well, it's it's very brief. I don't even have to pick up the book. I, I can remember it. The, the first chapter is "fuck you." <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, there... on to chapter two. <laughs> exactly. Well, okay, there you go. Obviously, if people are browsing in a bookstore, that first chapter will capture capture their attention. But I'm cu curious, why did you decide to start the book that way? Was was that first chapter there from the beginning, or did you come back later and 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 add that uh -huh. in? Uh, Jeff, those were the first two words I wrote, and I had no story, no other idea, nothing except sort of what I later referred to in the book as attitude. you know, a, a constant state of bad attitude. And I guess that's what I had, and I started the book with those two words and then went, okay, so so what if, what if you start a book there? Where would it go? And then all of a sudden, I find myself writing in, from the point of view of a 20-something-year-old Orange County girl talking about her friend who has bad attitude, and, and the story went from there. <laughs> Great. Well, for, for, um, for someone who, who's listening who hasn't read or heard about Savages yet, can you give them a sense of what the book is about exactly? Sure. It's, it's, about, it's about three people, two men and a woman, who are involved. Uh, both men are in love with this woman. It's kind of Jules and Jim in some ways. And uh, these two guys are marijuana growers, and, and they have this sort of peaceful marijuana business. And uh, one of the Mexican cartels, this is in Southern California, comes up and says, look, you're out of the retail business. From now on, you're going to grow your stuff and sell it wholesale to us. And uh, these guys say, no, thank you. We'll just leave the business. But the cartel insists that they remain as growers and suppliers. And, and to enforce that arrangement, they kidnap the girl. And then it's about how these two guys go about getting her back. Right. Well, how do you go from a degree in African history at the University of Nebraska to writing about the low lives of Southern Cal and characters like Ophelia, whose nickname is Multiple O? I'm curious, what was the path to writing and publication like for you? Were you someone, Some a lot of writers say they grew up and knew that they wanted to be a writer from the time they were five or six, or was it something that came to you later in life? What was it like for you? Well, I knew I wanted to be a writer from the age of five or six, certainly. Now, whether I've ever grown up is an open question. There are various <laughs> opinions on that one. I think it depends on the day. You know, sometimes I say I'd like to grow up, but I can't afford the pay cut. You know, uh, I hear you. Because everything I used to get in trouble with in junior high, now they pay me to do. Uh, but I always wanted to be a writer. But, you know, no one snaps your passport. You know what I mean? If, if, if you go to college, in my case, University of Nebraska, and you get a degree in medicine, you're a doctor or, you know, you're a lawyer or whatever. Uh, that doesn't exist for novelists. So um, I always knew I wanted to write, and I always knew I wanted to travel, but I, I don't come from money, so I had to do things, you know, to make them pay for themselves. So 
I did a ton of different things. You know, I was a safari guide. I was a movie theater manager. I was a private investigator. I, I was an actor. I, I taught and directed theater for a while. And, uh, but always with an eye toward eventually writing. And because I'd been a private investigator and because I loved the crime genre as a reader, I thought, well, that's what I'll try to write. And, and eventually you end up writing a book like Savages, I guess. Sure. Well, well I know from, from reading and, and, and reading interviews and doing research for this, for this interview that you, if I'm not mistaken, you did grow up and, and you know, some of the work that you just described was on the East Coast or in New York City. And, and yet I know that Orange County, California is the setting of your new novel, Savages, and the Southern California Mexican border was the setting of some of your earlier novels. How did you right. how did you end up in California, and what is it about that um, that locale and that setting that that kind of speaks to you in terms of setting your novels and and there? Yeah. Well, work originally brought me there. Uh, when I was a private investigator, uh, I I was doing a lot of arson cases, and this was in the late eighties, early nineties, and and that was uh, what was going on then. It was sort of the the American capital of arson. And so that kept bringing me out to L.A. and San Diego and Orange County, and then I, I just fell in love with it. And I can tell you the exact day I fell in love with it. I had a, a free day, uh, and I decided to drive from, from um, Irvine, California to San Diego, and 20 minutes in, I hit the Laguna Beach, and I thought, this is great, and called my wife and said, you know, you got to come out here. And, <laughs> and so... Uh, for three years, we lived in hotels in, in Southern California because I never knew how long I'd be on a case, you know. Uh, and so we were sort of highly paid migrant workers in San Diego and L.A. and Laguna and these places. I find it endlessly fascinating. You know, uh, I love the physical beauty. I love the surf culture. I love the fact I, – I love California for the same reason a lot of people hate it, that it reinvents itself every day. You know, that, mm -hmm. that to me is, is endless fodder. Uh, and and the, the multiplicity of cultures and languages, you know, in San Diego County, for instance, there is no ethnic majority. And so if you go into a public space, you know, a beach, a cinema multiplex, a mall, something like that, you're hearing all kinds of different languages and dialects. And, and I love the musicality of that. It really appeals to me. And and frankly, I mean, it's a great place to write crime, you know, because it, it has a history. Sure. Uh, and and it, it has a present. It's it's to me the front lines now. Uh, you know, is the border. That, that's and interesting so that you say that. I mean, especially when you when you think about there was a story in in all of the major media in the last week or two talking about the the um, the demographics and and that you know, the majority white is going to not be the case a lot quicker than than many right. demographers had, had thought it was going to be. And, and yep. people have always said that California, where California goes, the, the nation follows. So it's kind of interesting that right. you're, you're talking about that because, you know, we, we're, we're definitely, you know, probably at the beginning, but of, of you know, seeing the 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 makeup of America change. And it's interesting that you're you're writing about that in your novels. Yeah, you know, and I mean, to me, it's fascinating and kind of heartening. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I, absolutely. I love to see when these cultures come together in, in, in really sociable ways. And they, and they do, with, you know, occasional exceptions, as always, you know, blockheads. But, but they do at the beach, <laughs> you know. And because I think, I think it's, that's a world where people are focused on enjoying themselves and enjoying each other. And and nature becomes larger, you know what I mean, than than any kind of distinctions inside of humanity. Uh, people are in awe of the ocean, and so you know it's 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 really fun to watch. It's fun to be a part of. That's great. Well, as you mentioned earlier, the Mexican cartel plays a, a part in savages. There's obviously been extensive news coverage recently about the violent war currently going on right now in Mexico, including car bombings, right. the, the war between the drug cartels and the Mexican government. Given your knowledge of Mexico, where, where do you think this is headed? Do you, do you have any sense or idea? 
I don't know that anybody has a real sense or idea. You know, I, I think, listen, I think it's going to get, uh, I'm sorry to say, worse before it gets better. Sure. Uh, you know, because the profits in the trade are so, so high that that people are willing to, to kill for it. And and what happens, of course, is an escalation of violence because the most violent person wins in a violent conflict. Sure. And and so the worst people rise to the top. The the problem is, anytime you arrest somebody at the top, now all you've done is create a job opening that is again yet more valuable. So you know it's it's great to have headlines of a you know drug kingpin. That's a cliche being captured or, or even being killed, and, and yet in reality you really haven't achieved all that much. So, I mean, the root problem of the Mexican drug war, of course, is not in Mexico, it's in the United <laughs> States. It's the demand. It's the demand. So the, the Mexican drug problem is, is in a sense, a, a misnomer. No demand, no supply. You know, there's no seller without a buyer. And so I, I think we have a, a really sort of hypocritical attitude about corruption in Mexico and the violence in Mexico, uh, because really it, it originates here with our, you know, our appetite for drugs. I think the other thing that, that you're going to see sooner rather than later is that war coming over into the United States. Sure, sure. Because the cartels now have presences in every American city in any town of any size. So far, for the most part, their their competition has been economic, you know, trying to get a better quality product out at a cheaper price like any other business. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to be long before, you know, something that happens in Mexico is going to trigger a killing uh, in the United States, and that will trigger, you know, a revenge killing, and then it's going to be on. Wow. Yeah. And and so what I'm very afraid of happening is is the violence that you see in Mexico. You know you're going to see fairly soon in San Diego, and then it's it's going to just miss past it. Sure. Past that. Well, that that's that's certainly something to think about. Wow. Well, uh, the, in terms of savages, the the prose and narrative style of savages is very distinct. It's it's certainly unlike a lot of commercial thriller novels. You write in a very streetwise vernacular. When you were working on Savages, is that something you were very conscious of? Did you have to work at that style, or did you just find that particular narrative voice and kind of see where it led you and, and, and hang on? I think, yeah, I think the latter, you know. I think that, um, uh, you know, I, th I think that the, the crime genre is getting sort of squeezed by, by too many definitions and too many expectations of, of what – crime novel should be, what a thriller should be, what a procedural should be. And in some ways with Savages, I wanted to throw my elbows a little bit um, stylistically. And, and I frankly found it pretty easy to do. Uh, I think the hard part was sticking with it. The hard part was not backing off of it, you know, because every once in a while I, I kind of get scared, to, to be really honest. You know, right. man, am I pushing this too far? <laughs> you know, is anybody going to get this? Um, are, are they really going to hate it? And so the, the difficult part was, was sort of maintaining the courage to do it. I was very influenced by the, the French New Wave filmmakers, you know, uh, 1959, 60, 62. Mm -hmm. um, because in, in my own way, I, I was maybe trying to do with the crime genre what, what those guys did with film narrative, which was sort of busted open a little bit, you know. So that's what I was trying to do. But but the voice itself, for good or for ill, and maybe this is a little frightening, you know, <laughs> came pretty easily. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I, would say, I would say so far the reception me. has been pretty well. It, it has, you know. Yeah. It's, it's um, it critically, you know, by far been, you know, my, the most successful book in terms of, of the critics. And, that's great. Uh, and that's, that's been, you know, both the pleasure and a surprise. That's great. Well, what's the what's the process of, of writing like for you? In in researching this interview, I read that once you do finish a novel or a project, that you rarely go five days without starting something new, whether it's a, a novel. Is is that is that really true? 
That's really true. That, that, that is sadly true. Uh, I, listen, you know, I mean, on my bad days, I think of writing as an addiction. You know, there should be a 12-step program or something. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, I love to do it. And uh, I, I think it's like a lot of other things. I mean, I think in some ways it's like athletic things or musical things that, that you need to always be doing it to keep getting better at it. You know, you, you need because I feel it. If I take a few days off. It's like taking a few days off from from exercising or something. You know, I, I feel it, the awkwardness and the strain and the effort when I come back. Uh, but it's it, listen, it's something I love to do. You know, right. and and so no complaints. Good, good. Well, what are you working Most on now? Days, you know, I've, I've had my whiny days. You know, yeah. Like else, <laughs> what are you working um, on you know, now? What, well, two or three books. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, last year, for instance, the, the previous 14 months, I wrote three novels and a screenplay. Wow. You know, one of them was Savages. One is a book called The Gentleman's Hour. Another book is a, a sort of interesting project called Satori, where I, I wrote a prequel to um, Trevanian's book, Shibumi. Uh, that comes out next March, and now, right now, uh, I'm I'm working on a another sort of epic length book um, called about Tommy Flynn, uh, which takes uh, the story of the Trojan Wars um, and and the Aeneid and puts them into a crime form with some things that really happened in in American criminal history, and and that's sort of an epic. Uh, and then I'm, I'm working on another detective novel, and and I'm doing a western, so so lots of stuff. Wow, sounds great. So well, so you know, I like having I, I, more I had, than one pony in the corral, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I had not realized about the the Trevanian um, sequel. If I'm not mistaken, given what I know of of popular culture in terms of publishing, wasn't Trevanian a pseudonym? And did they ever figure out who was actually writing those books? Do you know? Yes. Oh, I, oh, I do know. Yeah, Trevanian uh, was a guy named Rodney Whitaker, a Canadian gentleman, and um, uh, died a, a few years ago, okay. leaving a widow and an adult daughter. Uh, and you know, I I worked with the the adult daughter uh, Sasha Whitaker, um, who was you know very 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 kind and very helpful uh, in terms of doing this book. But in terms of refreshing my memory, wasn't there kind of a – when it was originally published, wasn't there kind of this kind of pop culture mystery at the time of who Trevanian really was? I think that's right. I yeah, think that's yeah. correct. Yeah, yeah. that's what I said. Yeah, I don't remember. know a lot about that, but I think right. that's right. Yeah. yeah. And he was a very private person apparently, you right. know, and, right. and was just having a really good time with the books. And, and you know, they were very successful. Uh, and so it was, it was a fun um, – interesting challenge you know to write a prequel to a character who's in his 50s when you meet him in Trevanian's book and I had to pick him up when he's he's 26 and so you're you're trying to write the the sort of evolution of a of a character of a personality you know and that that people know the end to but not the beginning so so it was, it was interesting to do that that's interesting is that is that a project where the the daughter and the estate came to came to you yeah yeah we um my agency literary agency represented the estate sure. and, gotcha. and they seemed to think it was a, a match and um you know i talked to the family for a while and then we all decided it was a match and so i went ahead and did it because i remember those books you know i was a big fan and mm -hmm. so you know the idea of of picking some of that up was you know you, how can you resist that? Yeah, <laughs> you <know>? totally. <laughs> well, with the success that you've achieved with your writing, if you had to offer advice to someone who's listening to this podcast and is intent on getting published as well, what what advice would you give them? Well, I, you know, a, a couple of pieces. The first one's going to sound glib, but I, I really don't mean it. Uh, to, and that is right. Writers write before it's a noun; it's a verb, you know. And, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of of, of sort of first time writers spend a lot too much time sort of thinking and planning and talking and delaying <laughs> and not writing know, all of that and not writing. At the end of the day, this is always going to come down to one person with some sort of writing instrument sitting in a room alone and working. I think Guy de Maupassant, you know, the great, great writer, said it best, said, get black on white. <laughs> and, and the other piece of advice that I would say is write what you want to write. You know, don't, don't go chasing trends. 
Exactly. Uh, because, but, frankly, by the time you start chasing them, that trend's over. Exactly. You know I mean? Yeah, totally. You just don't know it because it's gone around a curve you can't see. Mm-hmm. But, but the other thing is that, that it always comes out phony. You know, it always comes out like an imitation. And I think people write best when they write what they love. You know what what they're interested in, what they're passionate about, what you know, and 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 do what they really want to do. I think that energy then comes screaming through the page. So those sure. would be my two pieces of advice. Gotcha. And three, you know, always always give your major character a short name. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be okay. typing it over and over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> well, the the last f- ten or fifteen or even twenty years has seen a a lot of great crime mystery writers, to to name a few: Lee yeah. Child, James Lee Burke, mm-hmm. Laura Lippman, Michael Connelly. Not uh, to yeah. not to put you on the spot, but who are some of the writers that you look forward to seeing their books on the bookshelves and reading? Well, you mentioned a few of them right off the bat. I mean, Michael and Lee, uh, without a doubt, um, not only not only great writers, but terrific people. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, James Elroy, uh, I'm always looking for his his next book. Um, uh, you are putting me on the spot because okay, I'm sorry. really tired, you know. But <laughs> John Harvey in England, um, uh, Ken Bruin, uh, you know this. Uh, you know, I I really think that some of the best, and this is of course self serving, but I think it's true nevertheless that some of the best fiction writing coming out in the English language now um, is in the crime genre. True. True. You know, uh, so you know Dennis Lehane's book, The Given Day. Exactly. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. Sure. Yeah. Well, we're we're going to wrap up, but I did want uh, to Jefferson ask Parker. I, I should mention Jeff Parker and Joe oh, yeah. Wambau are all the people that you know I love to read and also love to get together with. Sure. Well, I know we're going to wrap up, but I did want to ask about the 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 state of the movie deal in terms of Savages. Where does that stand now? Well, uh, just before you called, I just hung up for an hour and a half phone conversation with Oliver Stone um, um, on the second draft of the screenplay uh, with him, and uh, he's directing it. That's wonderful. I'm writing the screenplay with him. So, um, and and my my good buddy and and another you know terrific writer Shane Salerno is is, is on it as well. So, so it's fun. A lot of That's fun. great. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Well, again, we've been speaking with Don Winslow, author of Savages, available in bookstores now. Don, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Sure. This is Lee Child, and I'm listening to the Reading and Writing Podcast. Thanks for listening to my latest interview. If you like what you heard, I would really appreciate a review of the podcast in iTunes. It's really simple. All you have to do is go to the iTunes store, and it takes a minute or two to leave a quick review of the podcast. And that way, more people can find the podcast, because the more reviews and ratings a podcast has in the iTunes store, the more they feature it and the more prominently they feature it. So hope you enjoyed the interview. Until next time, read some good books and support your local independent bookstore. And I'll be back soon with another interview with a writer that you enjoy reading.